We're not good. Welcome to episode 14 of the Impact Narrative. In a news packed programme today, we're going to be talking about Britain as well as uh, the Middle East and uh, maybe even bring in sport, culture, tide times, literature. Literature, the world of culture generally. I didn't think there. you were actually going to start, Mark. I, I thought that as I was trying to stop my emails from pinging. No, because, no the thing is there's a spontaneity about what just happened. There is. And it also shows that you get loads and loads of emails. It shows that we're live as well. E exactly, yeah. It, it, that, that's a kind of cutting edge presentation that exactly. we're bringing to the to world. To the table. Of, yeah, to the table with the thing. So, so uh, Simon. Right, yes. I'm the host this week, so oh, um, okay. let's begin with British politics. Uh, let's begin by just saying that there's oh. a lot of stuff happened. Uh, yeah, I kind of did. On our channel, Mark. Oh, on our channel. Oh, on the, right, the Siri Institute round. channel, yeah. If okay. you were to go to the YouTube page right now, you would find... And you will. Of course, you because you, well, you found this, so obviously you did. Mm. But you will find previous <laughs> episodes of the Impact Narrative. Yes. And... Lots of them. You will find about an hour's discussion on events in Syria that was um, from a round table last week featuring the two of us, um, Professor James A. Sweeney from Law and a future member of PPR staff, Rahaf Al-Dugli. Yes, yes. A, a Syrian woman who's brought some interesting insight into discussions. Very well, well, expert in deep, deep knowledge of the Indeed. area in particular. But, um, and it was a packed house, wasn't it? Was. It? it was a full house. There were stand people standing. Turning people away at the uh, the doors? No, 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 no. Because we don't do that kind of thing. No. But we do, we just herd them, them in, and, uh, pack them in, and, and make them stand. But in addition to that, you will also find a brief uh, ten-minute clip of a Richardson Institute internship program event. Right. From last year, in which our uh, sorry, from last week, in which our very own Roz won an award. I uh, think well, well, richly deserved. And um, there, w there weren't many dry eyes. No, those His eyes not. have to be moist, otherwise I reckon a dry eye would. Um, Sounds rather painful, work. doesn't it? Yeah, rather frustrating. Anyway, but yes. eyes. So, so you say eyes were moister than usual. There was were. more moisture uh, in the eyes. They were than indeed. usual. Anyway, a lot of content to get to grips with. A yeah, lot of stuff rather to, than all that to watch and um, yeah. guff, keep you busy while you're waiting with bated breath for the next episode of. Of the impact uh, narrative. Uh, narrative. Yeah, well, just, so, if you think this one's been good, then just wait till next week because oh, thing, things will happen. They will Arsenal will lose to Atletico at Atletico Madrid. This is um, true. And, uh, well, fingers crossed for Liverpool. So, uh, the big event, of course, was the departure from office of the Home Secretary, mm. Amber Rudd, and um, uh, a, a person who, in some eyes, was seen as a possible future Prime Minister. Did she stood uh, in the last leadership campaign, did she not? Or was it uh, no, 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 no. Was the one before? Uh, no, 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 no. But what she did do was to stand in for Theresa May mm. uh, in a leadership, in a debate during the last election at a time when she had just lost a, a father, I think, um, a father and she basically had a really very, very difficult time personally for reasons not of her own making. Right. Um, and yet she's accepted the most demanding job in government, sure. second to the the premiership itself, and um, unfortunately has come a spectacular cropper amidst what I think is the most revealing scandal of recent British political sure. history, a scandal that makes things like the expenses scandal look like what it was, which is just a piece of trivia, yeah. basically compared to real the real issues about the governance of Britain. So, so just let's go back yeah. then, Mark. Okay. Let's I've reversed the roles now. Yeah. I've tipped it on its head. So, yes. uh, yeah. So, this is obviously all to do with Windrush. Windrush, indeed, yes. And, um, and, and the whole Windrush scandal and, and everything that sort of led up to that, dating back to the, the um, efforts to reconstruct and rebuild Britain in the aftermath of the Second World War. Oh. So, right. um, yeah, well, you can so, talk about that, but I mean, well, again, I was going to say, the, the, there hasn't been much. Um, again, there's so many dimensions to this. But uh, one of them uh, would be, a, hopefully, producing a greater recognition of Britain's relationship with immigration, given that the 
the people who arrived on the Empire Windrush in the 1950s or whatever were people who were basically drawn into Britain deliberately because yeah. Britain needed uh, its labour force to be replenished. So let's, uh, Mark, mm. before we go into any, any real analysis, let's just give a whistle-stop history of what's happened here. So you've got the end of the Second World War, Britain uh, struggling to find its role in a, in a changing world, mm. um, huge pressures of decolonisation, growing nationalist sentiment, struggling to, to have relations and figure out what type of relationship mm. Britain should have with its, with its colonies, but needing labour, needing to rebuild the country, needing to rebuild the state as a whole. Yeah. So, bringing people in. Well, yeah, and I suppose if you, because there's far too much to talk about there, but what you might say is that before the Second World War there were dreams of imperial unity mm -hmm. in which a good labour force in, for example, uh, the West Indies, other areas of Britain's possessions, to have a great labour force on the spot was deemed to be a priority for Britain because there was a hope that the empire would become uh, an, an economic yep. union. Um, but then, of course, after the Second World War, Britain, the main thing was that Britain was basically bankrupt. And instead of wanting skilled labour to be dispersed to the various areas of the empire, we wanted the skilled or certainly able-bodied labourers, we wanted them to basically rebuild the mother country, inverted commas. Um, and so that's where this originates. Yeah. Um, however, I mean, because we haven't got uh, limitless time, there's an awful lot to... Um, to uh, say, but that if I we think is central, focus, though. well, it is, and, and what, and, and and because immigrants have always been seen, um, certainly in my lifetime, as a problem, it's worth reminding people about the Empire Windrush yeah. story because it, they were seen as absolutely essential. And of yeah. course, Enoch Powell, as we all know, as Health Minister in the early sixties, recruited nurses from various parts of the. Uh, Commonwealth and then later uh, said there were too many of these people in the country. But anyway, um, on the, the scandal, uh, what has happened clearly is that the British government has f uh, been faced with um, an issue of trust that the British people, uh, aided and abetted by certain sections of the media, have given the impression that, first of all, immigration is a bad thing for yeah. Britain, but also that the government has totally lost control of immigration. So we know, obviously, whistle-stopping through um, prom promises to reduce the net figure for migration to less than 100,000, yeah. almost an invitation to, uh, to fail, because, you know, for various reasons, these figures are not within the control of the government. So then a fallback, because of the series of very embarrassing headlines, which were acutely embarrassing to Theresa May as Home Secretary during the coalition government. Particularly when she was, uh, what she's been quoted as saying, that she wanted to make the environment hostile. Well, but this is it, you see. What you do, because you can't actually control, uh, exactly, yeah. what you do is to disincentivize. You try sure. to do all you can to dissuade people from uh, coming into the country. So... Um, that was the original idea, mm -hmm. basically to say, you can come if you want, but we're going to make life very unpleasant, and if you happen not to be a legal immigrant, we will find you. So vans going around vans saying, around. get out of this country, you vermin. All words to that yeah. effect. Um, a, a real sense of dehumanisation. I mean, oh. it's, it's a government regulatory sort of set of actions and set of institutions designed to regulate life and and prevent the the influx of, of people who are deemed influx being a favorite word of people on, on one side of the island um, uh, people yeah. deemed uh, undesirable but mm. the thing that, that strikes me is that regardless of of quotas regardless of of data on on individuals and and movement of people mm. these are people and mm. I think that's what this, this scandal really brings out, that, that regardless mm. of any of this hard data, this is just a, a truly well, abhorrent way of treating well, people. Exactly, and, and, and um, I mean, just, just to, to uh, uh, continue the story, because the horrible, hostile environment yeah. didn't work, what they then thought was one way we can control, this is all about control, yeah. and the government said, right, we can perhaps control numbers who we deport, we can set targets and we can find people 
who are recent, fairly recent or distant arrivals in the country, and if they haven't got the right paperwork, then we can, can, we, we can deport them, regardless of whether they've really made a contribution to the country, which is all the kind of the cliches that Theresa May is coming out with. Um, regardless we, of if their, their parents, their grandparents, were invited to come into the country and, and yeah. rebuild it. Absolutely, and so I mean the first, the, so I mean this is the, the scandalous element of it. It's a desperate attempt for the of the government to at least get a modicum of control over the migration issue, but what it's done is basically even further reduced yeah. people's trust in the in the government. The exercise was meant to re reassure people that the government has got this sort of yeah. partly under control, but I think it goes further than that. There's the target culture, yeah. the uh, which is has obviously got counterproductive size but beyond that the privatization um, mm. and so that the government will be employing agencies to do this work yeah. for them um, imagine just how incredibly crass this is because if you give a target of 10,000 a year yeah. let's say then these people will get go out and get 10,000 imagine a scenario in which they can actually track down let's say just a scenario where they can identify, let's say, 50,000 people who were illegally, genuinely illegally in the country. Imagine yeah. that hypothesis. They've got an incentive to actually only deport the 10,000 and leave the 40,000, you know, because, because of the, the target becomes a rigid thing. And going beyond this is actually damaging to the agency that's doing this because if they overperform, you know, they have got a vested interest in the problem remaining and perpetuating. If they actually deported all the people who yeah. were liable to deportation, they would no longer have any business. Yeah. yeah? So the, again, it, it goes to the heart of the way in which the hollowed out British state, basically the hollowed out political culture, all these things are embedded in this particular scandal. And it's very unfortunate that the person who's been left holding the baby, as it were, is somebody who by all accounts, I don't know her personally, but by all accounts is one of the most decent people right, okay. in politics, let alone in the government. Right. Uh, whereas I'm afraid Mrs May, because Mrs May is, I think, ultimately the, the source of all this, because as Home Secretary, she targeted immigration as the one issue that could break her politically and she became obsessed with immigration and this again is why she's leaned in the past towards a hard Brexit yep. because she doesn't want anything which will stop prevent Britain from getting a bigger grasp of immigration. In all this the idea that Britain is an attractive place for people to live, you, know, you, could, you really couldn't make it up. What they're trying to do is to destroy Britain's good reputation. Yep. Uh, all for to appease the Daily Mail basically, because that is a newspaper which is so raucous on this issue about a migration watch, the think tank, whatever, so the think tank using that in the very uh, loosest sense, spewing out statistics, a, a, you know, um, a number of people the size of Birmingham is arriving every three minutes or whatever. A swarm of people. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. Yeah, and, and in the end, you see, of course, the people, the officials who were in charge of other departments, the Treasury, for example, say... Well, the market will regulate this, that Britain will become a honeypot for immigrants until the moment where there are too many people chasing the jobs, at, at which point there'll be an outflow. And that is the, the, the kind of free market right wing view of all this, to be yeah. intensely relaxed about immigration. So you've got part of government that's more than intensely relaxed and another part of government which is b verging on the ugliest manifestations of, of ideology that the world has seen. Yeah. Regarding people, as you so rightly said, not as uh, individuals but as numbers, and basically ripping up people's lives well, to fulfil a target. That's the thing that, that really strikes me, Mark, that, that within all of these different positions, and, and I agree with you about the construction of those positions, but regardless of those, there's this rejection of, of people, a rejection of agency and the importance of people as mm. as central to, to not only economic life but political life, social life. And if you've not got an environment within which people feel happy, comfortable, able to express themselves, mm. able to live their lives and, and thrive and flourish, then people will not move. <laughs> this, this idea as a, as a market self-regulating is, is, I think, deeply flawed. Well, it, absolutely. I mean, there's a wonderful book by Harjun Chang called 23 Things That Don't Teach About book Capitalism. Which could very easily be booked. I think week. I've got that book. Actually. It's excellent. Mm, right. And um, what Chang does is he, he 
he goes through a number, 23, in fact, yeah. assumptions that people have about capitalism, and he, he destroys them. But central to it is this idea that agency is key, and that agency and context-specific mm. contingent factors are key in making and shaping economic climates and economic contexts. And I think that's, that's really what's missing here, this treatment of, of people, this, this lack of the mm. ability to treat them as people with general decency. Mm. And there's, there's all of this talk of, of global Britain having this appeal post-Brexit. But you cannot appeal to someone if there is no treatment of people as people with basic ah, dignity and rights. But as you say, because of the cockeyed thinking, because of the media-driven, the Daily Mail-driven agenda of the government, then they don't care that Britain becomes an ugly place. Ultimately, they want it to be portrayed internationally as a, a place where you wouldn't want to live if the alternative was Well, that's anything. certainly one of the camps, but then as you say, that there is this sort of this well, the others. Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. towards the free market mm. migration of, of people and self regulation and and mm. and somewhat bizarre claims like that. And that's a real contradiction. Oh absolutely. Terms. It's like two governments driving into exactly. totally different uh... riding two horses simultaneously in different directions. Mm. Mark, the other question that I had about this is that the one of the reasons that this escalated so quickly is that data was destroyed. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that? I mean, why was this data destroyed? Uh, I, but <laughs> you've asked me a question to which, I mean, it just seems fairly unfathomable because obviously this was, as the Prime Minister has gleefully pointed out, the the decision to destroy landing cards or whatever was taken under, the, under our Labour government. But, of course, uh, well, I would imagine it's a spring cleaning exercise. That's all I can imagine, that governments like libraries, etc., now hate paper and you know to actually put all of that material online would be again it's a cost cutting exercise as well you need people to store this stuff and have to pay them or to put them onto a computer then you know you're going to have to pay them a lot so it may well be that somebody saw all these landing yeah. cards and thought this is paper what's it doing in the home office <laughs> um so and then of course it was carried out. I mean, I don't think there's any possibility that the landing cards were either ordered to be destroyed or destroyed as part of this. The, I mean, it was always so obviously going to be a disaster. Yeah. What's happened is, I'm afraid, and it could be Amber Rudd, somebody has taken their eye off what was happening on the ground, as it mm -hmm. were. Somebody hasn't had a nose for trouble because, I mean, it is just. Even a newspaper on the right of the spectrum is going to side with the Empire Windrush generation. Uh, I mean, these are, these are people who have such considerable, genuine public yeah. sympathy, yeah. Uh, which is, a, I think, a, a great thing and should make people think again about the subject of immigration. Really Why are these sure. immigrants so welcome when all the others who are coming here to work, etc., yeah. are not? But, you know, this is human nature we're talking about. So I don't think there's a conspiracy. So you're not suggesting there's any type of nefarious activity or...? I wouldn't have thought so because, it, 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 I mean, if somebody did it, maybe there was a, a conspiracy within a conspiracy that somebody said, I know how we can destroy the government's hardline on immigration. We can get them to destroy themselves by, uh, by deporting members of this particular generation. Yeah. It could be some left-wing mole, uh, but I very much doubt it. It's just, again, government ineptitude, which um, is par for the course, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's certainly a thing with, with conspiracies and perceived nefarious, pernicious action. <sighs> There's this, this belief that secrets can be kept. Mm. and government mm. and intelligence well, agencies and institutions are notoriously and, leaky. Well, and, and they're getting leakier and leakier as yeah. the government is more and more hollowed out. The boundaries of secrecy are collapsing and poor old Amber Rudd, and I keep being sympathetic, maybe I shouldn't be, but I think I should, uh, she's been the victim partly, quite rightly, because lies were exposed, or at least yeah. mm, distortions were exposed, but somebody in the Home Office has just been leaking <laughs> like a tap, uh, you know, and, and she opens her mouth and there's a leak that says, mm. you've just been saying something which isn't accurate. So, Mrs Rudd has gone. Yes. Leaving a new Home Secretary. Yes. Sergeant Javed, who is the first uh, ethnic minority Home Secretary. Uh, well, holder of any of the great offices of uh, state, well, what used to be called the great offices of state, and are now obviously just mm. menial. The Chancellor is still a figure of some substance. He could make the Home Secretary again 
a figure of some substance. But all this goes back, I keep to the students or whatever, they should read the David Blunkett diaries, the, the Blunkett tapes, yeah. because he was Home Secretary and he was a person of substance. He was a person admired widely throughout the country. So. And he was reduced to a tool of Tony Blair. Tony Blair, the, the, the Home Office under Blunkett, was just sitting by the phone waiting for Blair to tell them what to do as a knee-jerk reaction to the latest piece of bad news. It's a horrible story and vividly recounted by Blunkett. The Home Office has not recovered. But uh, Mr Jarvid, I mean, if he... I mean, I think that his, his easiest task is to, to, to start building bridges with the Windrush generation. Sure. But, and I, was in an, I did an interview with... Russian radio yesterday uh, talking about this and enjoying the the freedom they allow for you to say things um, that um, uh, really in order to make a difference to Home Office policy he's gonna have to re-educate the British public yeah. because that is the point the hostile environment has got overwhelming public backing it's just they didn't want the hostility to be visited on sure. the Windrush generation uh, and he is in a tremendously powerful position and there are other things involved, his attitude to Bre Brexit obviously is very deeply involved in all this. Um, so he is at the moment a pivotal figure with a great, I think, gust of public um, goodwill behind him. But what, well, he can't really, the, it's a dysfunctional department and it's almost, it's, it's, the hollowing out of British government is all sort of visited on the Home Office sure. because it's always been a sweeping up department that basically does all the things that other departments don't. Well, the number of things other departments do badly grows by the day almost, yeah. so the Home Office becomes more and more of an impossible job and a good luck to him. Yeah, well, I think as uh, as the days and weeks go on, we'll get a sense of how, how viable he is as a as Home Secretary and how viable the uh, department is itself. Yeah, it seems horrible to say this, but it would be interesting to see what the betting is on the days before his first mm -hmm. embarrassment. Because the other thing that was knife crime, where... Amber Rudd said this has nothing to do with police numbers and then a memo was leaked which says it's got quite a lot to do with police numbers. It's an impossible, impossible job. Yeah. So, mm, on to... that was, a, um, that was a, a, a good in-depth discussion I think of, of Windrush. But given time constraints, mm. I think what we'll do here is just shoehorn Harjun Chang's 23 things about they don't teach you about capitalism in as book of the week. Okay. So imagine. Yeah. Uh, it's it's on a shelf can, somewhere about there. Really? Well, you can it, wander off. It is, but I well, could get Ross to do it. Um, but it's, it's an excellent book, well worth a read, and, and certainly engages with a lot of the assumptions that people make about about capitalism and free markets. Yeah, I thought you were being a bit, um, you know, uh, committed in some of the things you were saying there, implying that capitalism is not as has been said, uh, although said about democracy, but you could apply it mm. to capitalism, uh, the worst system ever devised with the exception of all the others. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so this, uh, the, the, this programme doesn't want to, um, no. you know, uh, Russell Brand has not as yet taken over this programme. No, nor have I been recruited to appear on his show, unlike other academics. But um, that's a conversation for another time. Ah, it is. Um, Iran, mm. Israel. Yeah, well, uh, so perhaps I'll um, pose questions to you now. Let's wrap this up with a, um, a brief discussion mm. of, of where we're at with that then, Mark. Yes, well, uh, you know, the world has been celebrating, the stock market's going up all the way around the world about the North Korean thing, exactly. and suddenly the world's attention switches back to Iran. So, Simon, yeah. could you explain maybe why, uh, or uh, the, 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 the reasons why there was this rather sensational outburst press conference by the Israeli Prime Minister? Sure, so we're reaching the point where there has to be a decision on the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is essentially the, um, the diplomatic deal um, between the P5 plus 1, Britain, France, China, America, Russia and Germany, the one. The permanent and, five, the UN permanent five. Exactly, mm -hmm. and Iran. And that was uh, to put an end to this nuclear program, to allow Iran to have a peaceful civilian nuclear program subjected to verification, monitoring, inspection, and a range of different uh, mechanisms of oversight. Mm -hmm. It was to put an end to fears about nuclear proliferation across the region. It was to try and bring Iran back into the diplomatic fold. Mm -hmm. And it was hailed by many across Europe as a wonderful piece of diplomatic action. Mm. Now, 
it was deeply unpopular in some other quarters. In Israel, mm. Saudi Arabia, and some of the more hawkish members of the, the US administration. And um, Mr. Trump was, was a staunch critic of the, uh, of the deal, calling it the, um, the worst deal he's ever yeah. seen, and words to that effect. And has said that he and he's made some pretty him. bad deals. Well, he has. Yeah. He's made an art of it. Yeah. And um, there's there's talk of of him wanting to junk the deal, to cancel the deal, try and improve the deal for U.S. audiences, for the U.S. itself. Mm. But um, it's reaching the point where Congress and the U.S. have to decide what they're going to do, whether they're going to continue with it or not. So I think mm. what we see with Mr. Netanyahu's speech yesterday is an effort to try and shape that debate. So there was a dis uh, an alleged discovery of a cache of, of Iranian secret files and documents that was revealed by Mr. Netanyahu in a, in a rather cloak and dagger manner of revealing it by pulling down a black sheet to reveal a row of ring binders. Mm. Yeah, and wonderful stage management. And CDs. Mm. And it's a CD a collection. It says Iran lied. And the shock horror yeah. is that it uh, sort of contained um, a Lionel Richie uh, CD. Because I've heard he's a bit of a. I haven't. I've right, just made okay. that up. Oh, it's possible. I mean, um, mm. uh, Krista Burr was incredibly popular in Iran. Really? Truly. God. But uh, is there no depths to which that country <laughs> cannot plummet? So um, this alleged discovery has been has been criticised. Uh, a number of intelligence officers have said this this doesn't really add up. It's been wildly uh, criticised mm. as as being out of date from the early two thousands or being from before the the deal was signed. Mm. So Mr Netanyahu has been criticised for what he's tried to do, which is clearly a political mm. manoeuvre. It's it's for political purposes rather than for any oh, yes. intelligence um, efforts. So uh, the Israelis have said they're going to share this information and intelligence with the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Who know all about it anyway. Who know mm. everything because they're the ones involved in verification, mm. monitoring and inspections. It's nice of him to share. Isn't it? Yeah, mm. It's very kind of him. Um, that he's going to share it with the British, the Germans, the French, the Americans. But I think it's all part of a political game. Mm. It's part of a political game to get the Americans to can the deal to say, right, this doesn't work, we either need to be stricter or we need to do something to stop Iran. Mm. And this isn't so much just about the nuclear issue, although that clearly is a concern, given Israel's strategic depth, given Israeli existential concerns about Iranian sure. action. Mm -hmm. But it's about Iran's support for groups across the region, such as Hezbollah, the Lebanese party of God, uh, for groups in Iraq, for uh, President Bashar al-Assad in Syria. There's a concern that Iran is destabilizing the region. and. Mm taken alongside this fear of a nuclear power, nuclear emboldened Iran, that's a concern for the, uh, for the Israelis. So I think this is part of a, a much bigger game of posturing yeah. and a sort of political performance, trying to get Mr. Trump to can the deal, to get something much stronger. And mm. I think in the coming days, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how this all pans out. Yeah. Yeah, well, admirable summary as, uh, uh, as usual, but... Um, uh, the uh, intention, I guess, this is the thing that it's been exposed as being fairly old news. It's a bit yeah. reminiscent of the famous dodgy dossier Indeed. and that kind of thing. Uh, very reminiscent, in fact, of the presentation. The difference was that Colin Powell, when he went to the UN to prove that um, Iraq was yeah. f f brimming over with weapons of mass destruction, was that you could tell he didn't believe a word of it either. And there was a kind of what looked like, I think at one point, what looked like an ice cream van driving around, like grainy footage, and him saying, This is uh, uh, the, the kind right. of the nerve center of the Iraqi death machine or something. Um, uh, so the difference is that this is a, the the, yeah. the front man at the press conference actually wanted the world to believe it. But the main thing is that it's the moon music, isn't it? It's the impression yeah, exactly. made that he knows that nobody's going to care about the rebuttals. All they'll care about is this yeah. the ring binders and the well, Lionel Richie CDs. Well, he's before, of course. He's he's gone to the UN and he's he's taken his his powerpoints and he's taken his slides and he's he's taken a, a drawing of a bomb. Mm. to refer to Iran as a nuclear weapon state and he said, um, I, I quote directly, if it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, then what is it? A bomb. It's a duck. All oh, right, but sorry. This duck is a nuclear duck. Right, yeah, yeah. quack. Yeah. And it's ready to quack near, it's ready to, near to you. Quack. So well, I think it's the, 
there's a, a track record of it. You look at, at Mr. Netanyahu's mm. rhetoric from coming to office many moons ago, uh, from his first first period of mm. prime ministership. It's a continual uh, set of, of speech acts where he is framing the Iranians as a threat mm. to peace and security. So in the coming days, it'll be interesting to see how this all pans out mm. across uh, across the international community. Whether the Americans yeah. uh, agree to, to signing up to the deal again, whether the deal holds, and what um, what the Israelis do, because as you mentioned to me on the bus this morning, I just let slip that we take public transport. Yeah. That um, stagecoach, they, they we recommend them to all students who want to travel by bus in the Lancaster area. Indeed, they're excellent. Um, Other companies. Do not traveller's here. choice. No traveller's choice. Anyway. Oh, okay. um, the, the, the Israelis had struck uh, Iranian targets in Syria, so it's mm. a, a critical point. But Mark, mm. we are very much out of time. Are we very much out of we time? So we can't talk about time. Arsenal? No. All oh, right. Next week, if we win. Good, so that's, um, yeah, well, next week's episode is going to be a classic. It I is. can just sense it. We'll that's be able to talk about final. Arsenal. And Lebanese elections. Right, wow. Interesting times. <laughs> I don't right. know which one I'd rather talk about. Well, let's see how we t how we do. Yeah. So, without further ado, uh, it's a good night from me. And, and uh, good night from him. Good night. Good night. <laughs>